After hearing the news about the latest balance patch, Reddit is exploding with numerous topics about the changes, debating the scale and necessity of the new patch. There is quite a lot of criticism towards the new balance council, and I thought it would be a cool idea to guide you through many questionable decisions in StarCraft 2 balance history. And actually, StarCraft 2 has always had some balance issues, even when Blizzard was taking care of it. In this three-part story, I'll guide you through different, annoying or funny balance periods of StarCraft 2 that happened across all 13 years from the release of Wings of Liberty till modern days. I'll mostly focus on significant things that left a big mark in history and were remembered by the majority of players. This is part 1, where we'll cover Wings of Liberty from 2010 till 2013. So, StarCraft 2 was released in July 2010 and for the next one and a half year the balance was in a wild state. It's natural because the game was being adjusted to pro players and Blizzard were taking quick steps to solve all kinds of problems that might arise. This period was probably one of the best for the community. The game was lively, there were many changes and also many creative solutions by players. During 2010 and even before in beta, there were many attempts to hotfix issues and actions were taken in a quick fashion. However, despite frequent changes, the game was obviously far from being perfect. One of the most prominent issues of that period was the early game. For all three races it was quite difficult to survive till the mid-game stage, there weren't as many tools to do scouting, especially for Zerg and Protoss. On top of that, some freshly developed strategies and cheeses turned out to be too deadly. One of the scariest was 4 Warp Gate Rush. A Protoss player would use only Stalkers with a sprinkle of Zealots, trying to overwhelm his opponent with brute force. It might sound silly, but it worked really well. In Vix of Liberty the economic system was different, and you started with only 6 workers. Expanding was much more difficult, and Zerg overloads were slower, and the Protoss race needed to research illusions for centuries, which made scouting nearly impossible. Only Terran race had a reliable scan from the orbital, but considering this 6 worker economy, it was much more beneficial to invest your mana into mules. Violence also used to be different. It took very little time to do warpings, and on earlier versions you could also warp in units from the low ground to high ground, rendering any defensive advantage useless. This strategy relied heavily on proxy pylons and their placement, but it was later nerfed into oblivion and just ceased to exist. Alongside 4 warp gate cheese, there were also other cheeses for other races. Zerg players utilized 6 pool and 8 pool to do devastating early game attacks, and it was especially common in lower leagues. People at Dirt League even created a song dedicated to it. But it wasn't as scary as the turn bunker rush that was really strong in the early days of StarCraft 2. Two proxy racks were pretty scary specifically against Zerg players, who didn't have fast scouting as other races. Due to Overlords being too slow, it was pretty difficult to scout in time to react to it unless you used one drone to check out all the possible sites. However, such way of scouting was harmful for the Zerg economy, since the race couldn't make up for it like Terrans with their mules or Protoss with their Chrono Boosts. Bunker Rush has created a popular meme about Blizzard Balance Team, which was quite indecisive on that matter that they even changed Bunker Build Team 5 times during the course of one year. While this strategy didn't fade away, it got slightly weaker due to the nerfs, and some Zerg buffs will acknowledge just a bit later. The last thing that was bothering many people before major balance changes was Void Race. In the early days they had a passive charge ability, and they were pretty efficient on lower levels. Unlike the aforementioned strategies, they were not as OP, but Protoss players still use them in different all-ins and cheeses. Mass Void Race would soon become a meme, and there was even a community song dedicated to it. Zerg Race also had a nice trick in his pocket, something that was very obvious and yet surprisingly effective. Mutalisks were considered a great tool against Protoss Race, and it was incredibly difficult to deal with them without Phoenixes. Stargate wasn't a common opener, so if you managed to sneak in some mutas and keep on massing them, it was nearly impossible for Protoss players to come back from such a situation. While it was truly a risky strategy, 
It existed throughout the whole history of StarCraft 2, but it was probably the most viable one in the first 5 years of this game, and especially in its early days. In May 2011, Protospace got some buffs to deal with Mutas, mainly arc and range buff that allowed them to catch those flying creatures faster. In 2011, most of the early game tweaks and small balance changes were done, and the game was in a decent state with no really like major game-breaking issues. This year would be eventually remembered as the best year of Wings of Liberty, thanks to many great plays and moments, as well as players and a huge number of tournaments, especially in North America. With that being said, StarCraft 2 still had a lot of issues and the balance was far from being ideal. If we take a look at tournament results, the tournament race had more victories than both other races combined. As a result, Blizzard's balance team unleashed their fixing power and started nerfing Terran race, and in almost every patch this race suffered significant losses, while both Protoss and Zerg were getting new buffs. At the same time, there was one strategy that wasn't addressed in 2010. The mothership had a very strong ability called Vortex. This ability pretty much sucked in all of the units in the target area, thus making them invulnerable to any actions taken by any player. You could easily split someone's army in half, and that was probably the idea behind this ability. But players soon figured out that most units, especially the flying ones, were getting extremely clumped up in this vortex, making them vulnerable to AoE damage. This ability also allowed you to send your own units into a vortex, and soon Protoss players would put Archons in it to create a devastating blow upon release. This strategy was called Archon Toilet, and it's famous for exactly two legendary moments. And oh, both players being just so careful, afraid to commit here just because it is scary to take that step, you know? Oh my god. All right. So, uh, man, you know what? Kibikaki wanted a rematch, and he certainly made the most of it I because this game has been so. incredible. Wow. See what All happens right. when he doesn't forget Warp Gate Research. <laughs> So now he's going to make his way over to the right. Um, yep. We're just waiting for that big push for one of these players to commit. Kiwikaki's been wanting oh, to go here, go. here it goes. Oh, here we don't oh. go. Here we go now for sure. There's oh, the fungal. Look at the fungals on the everything. Are field. Oh. oh, is he going to jump in there though? Nope, the Archon's not jumping in. The mothership just getting a little bit aggressive. Oh, he's oh, got a second one. He it. got a second one. The Archons are not jumping in. Oh, there goes one. They are. And one and a half seconds, and then the Archons will come back. So final trying to get away by the Colossus. The army. are doing so much damage. Oh man, everything bunched up right there. And I think Kiwikaki, is he going to have enough? Is he going to take out the Broodlords? There are so few Broodlords left. Just a couple left remaining on the field. Oh, and then it's man. all ground forces. Kiwikaki's got it. He's got it. He's, He's got, got it. it. He's got it. I Kiwikaki takes this. out the last Broodlord. Oh, oh my, gosh. my God. 27 supply right now for Stefano. Stefano trying to make some units, but it is over, guys. Kiwi Cock is winning. Wow! Yes. Oh, I can't believe it! Oh that. my god! Wow. Oh man! Kiwi Cocky wins the most incredible game I have Whoa. ever seen! It is. It, I mean, an effective Archon Toilet is game ending. Right. I mean, he has... Does he have enough Archons to actually do that? You have to deal so much damage with Archons that... I mean, the BCs have so much help. And he's just pushing, man. He's like, all right, let's do it. Oh, my God. And oh, my God. oh, my God. Oh, my God. But no Archons. Where's his Archons? He needs to get the in there. He gunned down the Archons before it was uh, time. And the Void Rays come out. And Archon goes they're in. Gonna, they're they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna, Archon goes in. Get in there. Oh, my God. What are we seeing? amount of supply on that island. What? MVP has no money left. I Squirtle can't believe just won that won game. game. Oh. Oh my god. While it was an epic way of ending the game, it annoyed many players because of its gimmick nature. It was quite random and too powerful at the same time. One spell that could easily ruin the entire match in just one fight. Blizzard tried to fix it with a small change, but it was still used for the eternity of Wings of Liberty, since it was the only strong thing that Protoss Rays had in their late game arsenal. Carriers and air compositions were not nearly as useful, and ground armies suffered heavily from Zerg late game combo. At the start of 2011, the Zerg race was probably the weakest race due to the previously mentioned problems. The core problem was in its design. The race was meant to be reactive 
and stay on the fence with a huge economy, but at the same time it lacked reliable scouting tools to prepare for incoming attacks. It was addressed by many players, and even Idra complained about this issue. Zerg cannot scout. Marines can prevent overload scouting if you are at all careful about it, and it's not a huge investment. You just need two or three Marines on the perimeter, and wall-ins block any kind of ground scouting. Zerglings, drones can't get in. Poor scouting meant one thing. Zerg players had to adjust on the fly, play really risky and greedy, or try to use more expensive units, such as roaches, for early game defense. As a result, only few Zergs could advance to the late game stage, where they would unleash their most game-breaking, absolutely overpowered composition of Broodlords and Infestors. Uh, the Broodlords coming out now, and they're doing a great job here. Look at look at a perfect uh, uh, arc of nice spreader invested Terrence. I do believe we are about to have our second finalist here in That's right. the GSL. Oh, GG! G -G. This composition technically existed ever since 2010, but it was rarely used until 2012, the darkest period of StarCraft II history. How could such a powerful composition suddenly become available, with no direct buffs to these two units? Well, let's get back in time a bit and take a closer look at some changes that were done to the balance. So, as I already said, it was indeed hard to create this army composition. Most Zergs died in the mid-game, or they didn't have a big enough advantage to utilize that properly. But even if you managed to get such a scary army, other races still had ways to counter it. For Protoss it was more difficult, but still doable with a mothership core. As for Terrans, they had ghosts that were extremely good against most chunky targets, and you can clearly see that in this legendary moment with MVP and Nasty. 14 oh, Vikings 14 and 18, Vikings, 18, ghosts. 18 ghosts. I do not know if there's any way that MVP can even kill off this army quickly enough. Nesty still has so much money rally. And there, Nesty now sees the front line of MVP. MVP now knows what he is up against. Here we go, Sean. The unit count is ridiculous, and I think Nesty's realizing he may have overproduced massive amounts of cloak. Now stepping forward, we see the Infestor starting to work forward. Snipes uh -oh. go more. There's oh. the snipe. Broodlords continuing to rip through absolutely everything. The food Sniping counts. every single Broodlord. Oh my goodness. Has MVP done it, Sean? MVP crushed in the winner's bracket. Finals now has just forced a 41-minute game with nukes. Snipes. MVP. GG! MVP wins! MVP. Ghosts were nerfed pretty much in every balance patch, but the biggest hit was done on February 21st, when the damage of Snipe Shot was reduced by 20 rendering them useless against Broodlords and Ultralisks. The damage was too little to be game-changing, and you could easily prevent that from happening thanks to Infestors and Fungal Groves. But the biggest balance change went almost unnoticed. Zerg Queens got plus 2 range for ground attack, and Overlord started moving slightly faster. These miniscule changes created a massive domino effect that collapsed the whole structure of balance in only one year. Remember, in theory the Zerg race had the strongest late game, but now it could also be much more consistent in early and mid game. Now you didn't need to invest money in roaches, you only needed queens and links that countered most harass tools that other races had. And actually, Protoss had none of that except for a war prism, and Terran race could only use Helens and Banshees, and both units were easily shut down by queens. All of a sudden, the Zerg race rises up from the ashes and becomes the most OP race ever. In 2012, it dominated every tournament, and there were many more Zerg players at each occasion. Even the term Patch Zerg was coined during those days. You can also check out my video about the army composition in the description, where I talk about it in more details. And still, in 2012, somehow we had only Protoss in the global finals. How did that happen? Protoss race had three buffs that were insignificant at the first sight. Sentry build time was decreased, upgrade cost in forgery got cheaper as well, and Immortals got a plus one range buff. Separately, each of these changes wasn't as big and important, as most of these things were indeed necessary and welcome. But combined, all these buffs created a completely new strategy called the Soul Train. The Soul Train was created by Parting, a famous Korean player. It was a sentry mortal push that relied heavily on perfect micro and force field placement. Thanks to the buff, Immortals now could safely outperform Roaches and engage effectively behind force fields. This was a very risky playstyle aimed to kill the Zerg player, and the Zerg race had no real tools to deal with force fields. You could only bait for them or try to get a 360 degrees around, 
which was difficult on some maps. This strategy became infamous because it got widespread quickly. It demanded the perfect execution and timings and was kinda difficult to play with, but it was a build order that almost every Protoss player knew. Why? Because the other option was playing in a late game against Broodlords and Infestors, hoping only for the Mothership Vortex spell to bring you a desired victory. The end of Wings of Liberty was marked by a terrible balance and repetitive gameplay. While Blizzard undertook some attempts to fix all these issues, their action was probably slow and it didn't really help, so they chose to wait for a big balance revamp in How to the Swarm that was just around the corner and would be released in March 2013, thus ending the 13 months reign of Broodlords and Infestors and Protoss Olins. So let's sum up the state of the balance. Mirror matches were kinda okay with a good variety of strategies, except for PvP, which was too inconsistent due to many cheeses and Olins present there. ZVP and ZVT were hard for both Terran and Protoss races, but while Protoss could hope either for Vortex or Soul Trains, Terran really had zero tools and the 2012 Premier Tournament results speak for it, with Zerg dominating the pretty much entire landscape. As for PvT, it was probably the only matchup worth seeing in those days. It wasn't ideal and there were still some minor issues, but it was at least better than anything else. The balance was kinda alright, and with this to micro and multitasking, each player could perform well. This was the summary of Wings of Liberty Balance, from very creative 2010 and 2011 to surprisingly stall and boring 2012 and early 2013. StarCraft 2 found itself between a rock and a hard place, and it needed a big shake-up to save the game and players who were dissatisfied with the state of it. Luckily, How to the Swarm was soon to come, but would it be able to save it? We'll find out the answer in the next part later. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this story, make sure to like and comment this video and help me spread this knowledge. And don't forget to check out some other content as well. Have a nice day, and see you next time.